I'm calling to order the Monday, May 11, 2015, Planning Commission meeting of the City of Grand Point. Um, I would like to ask the following to lead us in the uh, uh, Pledge of Allegiance, and that would be our new commissioners, Commissioner Scott McMahon, Commissioner uh, Murphy, and Commissioner Nelson. Ask for a roll call. Please let the record reflect that all commissioners are present. Okay. Uh, we move on to uh, reorganization of the uh, Planning Commission. Do we have any uh, motions for a uh, chair and vice chair? Please, after you, Danny. Madam Chair, I would like to nominate April O'Connor. Second. Discussion? Okay. All those in favor? Signify by saying aye. Motion passes. Congratulations. There, there is one. Do we have a uh, yeah. any nominations for vice chair? Yeah. Madam Chair, I would like to nominate Liz Krause. I'd Thank you. I would also uh, like to suggest a nomination. Um, I think uh, Eric Nelson has. Um, has had have received five votes from the uh, city council, um, and I, you know, and and the other aspect is we've always tried to have a rolling um, uh, position for vice chair and chair. Um, so I I think um, it would probably be uh, more appropriate, especially um, since you know. Um, I agree with you totally. Okay. Yes. yes. Sorry. <laughs> All I right. Said that earlier. I'll second that nomination for Eric. All right. Any discussion? <coughs> Votes? All those in favor? Okay. Motion carries. Oh, Liz, you're. Are, are we going to try it again? Her, okay. Her thing didn't work. Okay. Still here. Is it? Yeah. Is it turning? Yeah. There we go. There are two pending votes. <laughs> okay. <coughs> if it's blinking, it's fine. If it's not blinking, you need to. So yeah. I think. Blinking is fine. There are two pending votes, so I think. There's one now. There we go. There we go. Okay, okay so the motion passes five to zero. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> so at this point, I'll let the record reflect that um, that as chairwoman, the newly elected chairwoman. Um, I'm moving on to uh, approval of the minutes. And um, do we have a motion or a discussion for, for the minutes? Uh, I'll second that motion. Okay. Um, was there going to be a discussion from the city attorney on that? Or? Well, I was just going to comment uh, for the benefit of the public that um, it, a question has come up in advance of the meeting. People are kind of curious, how are we going to approve the minutes since um, we have three new commissioners that weren't part of the commission in the past? And uh, just as a legal matter, it's, uh, it's, it's legally perfectly fine for 
um, the new commissioners to vote on the minutes, it's in particular since they happen to be at the last meeting, um, although that's not relevant uh, legally. Um, what we're doing is just blessing the sort of official record of the last meeting. All right. Then uh, we have a motion, and actually, I, I can't make the motion. Somebody else has to make the motion for the minutes. <laughs> and I move to approve the minutes of the previous meeting of April 27th. Thank you, Commissioner McCann. And uh, it was seconded by the vice chair. Uh, please register your votes. And that motion passes with four in favor of it. I'm abstaining because I uh, wasn't there. Um, so that uh, the minutes are approved. Um, now we move on to public comments. Anyone wishing to address the Planning Commission during the public comment section or on an agenda item is asked to complete a request to speak form available at the door. The completed form is to be submitted to the Planning Commission Secretary prior to an individual being heard by the Planning Commission. Any person wishing to address the Planning Commission on a subject other than those scheduled on the agenda is requested to do so at this time. In order to conduct a timely meeting, there will be a three minute time limit per person and an overall time limit of 15 minutes for the public comments portion of the agenda. State law prohibits the Planning Commission from taking any action on a specific item unless it appears on the posted agenda. And are there any requests to speak forms that do not include the agenda item? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I think. Okay, uh, Mary Hartman was. Are you? Uh, are your public comments for the parking issue? Okay, so um, right now it's just general comments, and I'll put yours in for the agenda item. And then Enzo, and I'm. That's okay. <laughs> for parking as well. Parking as well, okay. And Buck Hill? It's general. It's general, okay. Then you know the drill. Come up and Thanks. state your name and city of residence. I'm Buck Hill, an 18 year resident of Dana Point, and I've been associated with this group called uh, Residents for Responsible Development. And as you may know, there's a uh, voter initiative that we've. Uh, begun. I'll tell you more about it in just a second. But first, I'd like to welcome the three new uh, planning commissioners. Thank you very much for volunteering your time. And this is a tough job. And uh, it, it's great that you bring your cumulative experience here. And I applaud you for it. Thanks. Um, it's unfortunate. It's like you're entering the game at the Super Bowl stage rather than the first uh, pre prelims of the season. This is probably, tonight's decision is probably the biggest decision that this, the Planning Commission has made in years and maybe the biggest one to be made in the next several years or if not decades. What it's going to do is change the zoning and the, the plan for the town center forever, I, I would hope. Um, and, and I ask you to, as, as you try to decide how to go forward, Please analyze the data and consider, is this a reasonable approach for the city and is it fitting to make it a general plan forever as opposed to the prior work of the Planning Commission was mainly looking at one project at a time and deciding at, at this moment in time and with the other developments in town center or wherever else in the city, is this project appropriate to serve those plans and build the city moving forward. Uh, one of the problems I've had in the past on the, uh, the subject tonight is that the analysis done has been very lightweight, in my opinion. Uh, there has been very little data presented other than Nelson Nygaard saying Mr. this Hill, is the right way to present. Mr. Hill, I'm proceed. sorry to interrupt, but it, if this is going to pertain to the issue that Everything comes later. Everything pertains to zoning in the city and approval of plans. I'm trying to set it as a very high level stage and what I'm arguing for is that data and analysis should be considered rather than just one person or one consultant's stated opinion. That opinion needs to be justified with some facts. And I challenge you tonight to hear facts on the town center and the parking because what's been presented is a bunch of examples without any data to go with them. Well, how many square feet of what kind of buildings? 
and how many parking spaces were required to adequately service those kinds of buildings. So I if you'll do a careful job here, and if Nelson and Nygaard will present something other than that same presentation we've all heard six times, other than maybe you new commissioners, we need data and facts that fit Dana Point. Thank you. Uh, Madam Thank Chair, just for the benefit of the new commissioners, since um, when we get to the parking item, obviously, um, well, not obviously, but since we know that there will be uh, two people recusing themselves and the uh, pro, uh, pro tem, <laughs> the vice chair will be handling that aspect. Uh, Mr. Hill's comments were obviously related to the agenda item, so my recommendation is that you just uh, treat it as you gave him a chance to speak already when you get to that. Okay, so, all right. Um, all right, then, we, m we move on to the consent calendar. There are no items on the consent calendar, and we go to public hearings, item three. A zone text amendment, ZTA 15-0001, and Local Coastal Program Amendment, LCPA 15-0001, to amend the City's Zoning Ordinance, Chapter 9.26, and corresponding Appendix E, generally referred to as Dana Point Town Center Plan, to address parking regulations, a change to the title of the document to Dana Point Lantern District Plan, and an addendum to the previously approved mitigated negative declaration, and that's continued from the regular Planning Commission meeting of April 27th, 2015. And um, as some of you already know, Commissioner Claus and myself must recuse ourselves from this item because we live within the 500 feet um, radius. Yeah, I was asked to uh, chime in on this issue uh, before uh, Commissioner uh, Claus and O'Connor uh, leave the room. Um, just for the benefit of the public to understand uh, how conflicts of interest work on these issues. Uh, under the Fair Political uh, Practice uh, Act's um, uh, regulations, if a planning commissioner owns property that's within 500 feet of a project that's being considered, uh, they're deemed to have a conflict of interest. There are some exceptions that can apply if the FPPC uh, evaluates the issue and makes a determination that um, that there is no f possible foreseeable financial impact on their own properties, but generally speaking, it's a presumption that there's a conflict. Uh, so it's not that there's uh, that they have any bias for or against the project or have been in, involved in any way, uh, shape, or form with it. It's just a matter of uh, having to follow the rules. All right, thank you. And let the record reflect that Commissioner Claus and I are leaving, and I turn over the meeting to uh, the newly elected vice chair, Nelson. So let the uh, record reflect that the two planning commissioners, uh, the chairwoman and Ms. Uh, Commissioner Claus have left the room, and I will now go ahead and uh, ask staff to give us a report. <coughs> yes, the item before the commission this evening is to implement the town center plan, which has been adopted by the city council. It does not change the zoning in terms of land use at all. It is an implementation section of the town center plan uh, to move forward with a parking program. Tonight's presentation will be a summary of the previous outreach meetings that have occurred, which commenced in November of 2013, um, and Simon Kershey, senior planner, will give a summary of those meetings. So there has been significant outreach to the, the community, a couple of joint um, city council and planning commission study sessions, uh, a summary of the documents that are attached to the staff report, which have been all of the previous documents that have been presented to past planning commissions and the city council in the case of two study sessions. And then a brief presentation by our consultant summarizing the key elements of the parking program. There are not any changes from the recommendations that were presented on April 27th, and this is a continued public hearing from that date. The, two, the three new commissioners were all present at the April 27th meeting. Staff held briefing meetings with each new commissioner to ensure that they have the same information that has been provided to past commissioners and to answer any questions. The commission had access to all previous staff reports and links to those meetings that were filmed. And I'd now like to introduce uh, Simon Kershey to provide a brief presentation. Thank you, Asla. Uh, good evening, commissioners. Uh, 
Um, so my presentation is um, very brief and it's just uh, a kind of a recap of the previous um, outreach meetings and uh, uh, planning commission study sessions and si uh, city council joint study sessions that have been conducted so far. Uh, 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 with today's meeting, uh, there will be a total of 16 meetings that have been conducted so far on this project. Uh, this process started in November of 2013 with the planning commission study session. Uh, in November of the same year, uh, the consultant and the sta city staff met um, independently with the residents and prop residential property owners uh, that uh, live within and adjacent to the Lantern District planning area. And then we also met in, um, in a different uh, meeting with merchants and commercial property owners of the residential district area. Uh, we also met with the Coastal Commission staff at their Long Beach office to uh, present basic concepts related to shared parking um, standards. So this was kind of the initial phase when the project um, kick-started um, in the city. Uh, then the second phase of public engagement uh, commenced in January of 2014 with a joint study session of Planning Commission and the City Council. It was at this meeting that the draft parking report was presented. Uh, this report had key findings related to um, facts of uh, parking situation in current parking situation in the Lantern District and uh, recommendations, uh, both short-term and long-term recommendations um, to deal with parking in that area. <coughs> then in August of 2014, the, co the consultant and the city staff met again with the Coastal Commission office at the Long Beach office and they presented the same uh, draft parking report which um, had more detailed um, parking uh, strategies and policies like I just said. Um, then in December of 2014, again, we held five um, different meetings with small groups. Um, each group had a planning commissioner, a representative of residential uh, property owners, and a merchant and a um, commercial property owner. And the idea of these meetings was to get a more of an informal and in-depth discussion on recommendations and get input from all the stakeholders. Um, then after that, we had in January another informal um, session or workshop, which was specifically targeted to commercial property owners in the town center, <coughs> and that was to discuss in depth the concept of shared parking between various user groups. And then the third phase of parking, I'm sorry, the third phase of public engagement commenced in 2015, this year in February with a joint study session of Planning Commission and the City Council. Um, there were five parking related policies that were presented at that meeting and they were identified in the presentation on the staff report. And after that, the first public hearing took place which had the actual zone text amendment and the actual code language, which was the last meeting, April 27th meeting, which uh, you all um, attended as well with the previous Planning Commission. So this is now the continued hearing on the zone text amendment and the local coastal program <coughs> amendment. And with that, I'll turn to um, uh, Patrick Siegman, our consultant, and he's gonna um, provide de some details <coughs> on proposed uh, zone text amendments. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. Good evening, commissioners, and uh, nice to be back here tonight. Um, in the in the interest of brevity, um, I will not repeat the presentation which I made last April 27th, which of course all three of you um, were in the uh, audience to see. Um, but I do want to highlight a, a few points, um, and in particular to address some items where there were questions and, and perhaps some confusion. So um, first one, one thing to mention is that this is um, the text amendments tonight to the plan are the implementation program that was um, originally envisioned when the town center plan was put together. Um, as you may recall, if you were involved in the effort, when the town center plan was adopted seven years ago, nearly seven years ago, um, one thing that um, was put in as an implementation item was to adopt appropriate parking requirements to go with it and a parking plan to go with it. Um, and so what we're bringing for you tonight is really that step. Then um, the recommended policies, the, the overall parking program 
has seven major policies. Um, the four that are in boldface, numbers three, four, six, and seven, are really the ones that require um, <coughs> zoning text amendment and which have been uh, brought before you tonight. The, um, just a couple of items that I wanted to, to address. Um, one question that came up is um, where did the uh, parking data that we relied upon in doing this study come from? Um, one important source was the 2008 parking study of the town center by Sarah and Piers, Transportation Consultants. Um, and just to, um, to clarify, this covered all of the parking in the town center, both public and private, <coughs> on street and off. Um, be because of the Great Recession, um, there's been very little development in the town center since then. Basically, this data was collected during the last year of solid economic growth. Um, and, and before the crash. Um, it was collected during the Festival of the Whale Feast, um, so that was March of 2008, and then spot checks were conducted during the following summer to make sure that conditions um, during the Festival of the Whales week matched up to busy summer week. And overall what that data collection found was that at the busiest hour of the busiest day of the week, uh, there were nearly 1,300 parking spaces empty, about 44% of the total supply. And by total, I mean everything, on street, off street. Um, and yet, as, as we heard frequently um, throughout the public outreach process, there is some spillover parking. Um, that is, um, people coming to commercial destinations in the town center, but then parking in front of residences so for example, at the Meridian Building, a uh, typical example we see um, several people parking in front of the uh, residential area. Often uh, they appear to be patrons of Lux Restaurant. Um, yet at the same time, we see that in the uh, data collected on the Lux Building, uh, at the busiest hour of demand, um, there's an entire level of underground parking that's ac accessible off the alley, which is sitting empty, although it's intended for customers and visitors to that building to use. Um, so what we, what we would say is that um, this kind of spillover where you have an overall surplus and often an overall surplus at the particular um, busy destination combined with some people parking in front of residential areas nearby um, is really about proper management um, you know, if you have one level of underground parking that's absolutely vacant at the peak hour, adding two or three more levels of underground parking um, won't help solve the problem. It's very much a matter of it's a little bit more convenient for someone to park in front of the adjacent residences than it is for them to take a right turn, go down the alley, and go into the garage that was built for them. Um, so then to to turn to the issue of, of, um, of the zoning text amendments in particular, um, adopting the right parking requirements, let's start with the non-residential uses. Um, one thing we see is that the existing zoning code tends to generate buildings and, and landscapes which look like this. Uh, this happens to be the Dollar Tree down in, in uh, Caco Beach, or it's the, I believe it's the Capistona Valley uh, Shopping Center, it's a formal, formal name. Um, that works, that's four parking spaces per thousand square feet, that's what that looks like. Um, and, and there are some good things ab about this that we should mention. Um, there's no spillover parking problems with this kind of, of building because there's about 100 yards of parking between the sidewalk and the front door. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a very different landscape and vision than what's shown in the town center plan or shown in the, in the rendering on the right. Um, of course, with the rendering on the right, where you have shops right up to the sidewalk, um, you have only a few parking spaces on the street in front, um, that necessarily means that some of the parking has to be either in shared parking lots nearby or under the building itself or behind. So um, just to summarize, the. Um, Recommended requirements for all the non-residential uses are two parking spaces per thousand square feet, but if and only if that parking is made available to the public as shared parking. Uh, property owners can keep the existing citywide rates if, um, and build according to those if they want. Um, 
And if they do that, then they can keep the parking private. In other words, they can build according to current code if they wish. Um, and then a, a another option would be to allow um, uh, developers of new buildings to pay an in lieu of parking fee, which would be set initially at $40,000 per space and adjusted annually to make sure that you can keep up with, for example, construction cost inflation. And um, so one thing we want to show in a bit more detail is um, why this tends to work in um, similar mixed-use town centers and why we expect it to work for the town center. So what's shown in this graph is the result of a shared parking model that we prepared. Um, this shows our estimate of parking demand at full build out of the Lantern District. And it assumes that the current mix of non-residential land uses would, would uh, continue into the future, but that the square footages would expand to full build out. And the result we see is that overall there would be approximately 1.8 parking spaces occupied per thousand square feet of non-residential use, which is about what we see in other real places. And why does this work? Well, what you see here is that indeed there are um, certain uses which um, generate a, a lot of parking demand per square foot, for example, restaurants. And if you had a town center composed entirely of restaurants, you'd need a lot more parking. Um, but what we see here is that if you look at this chart, which shows um, parking demand by hour of day, during the daytime, for example, at noon, you have a lot of office demand, that's the bottom in green. You have considerable retail demand, you have some restaurant demand, but then as you get over into the evening, and over on the right-hand side of the slide here is 8 p.m., you see that office demand has almost completely um, died down. Residential parking, I'm sorry, um, retail parking demand has diminished somewhat, and restaurant demand is up. But overall, what you typically get um, in a downtown with this much um, office space and general retail space is that demand occurs around noon, um, and so you see that overall, because of the efficiency with which different uses can share parking, you get this kind of demand. And we see that when we, in fact, look at overall peak parking demand uh, in other communities. So, for example, there are many examples spelled out in the uh, overall report, but you see places like Newport Beach. And just to clarify, these parking demand numbers, which are presented in the report, and this one here, includes all parking demand, both on street and off, and it includes um, uh, counts taken at the peak days of the year. So for example, Newport Beach, 1.8, Monterey, 1.2, and so on. Then on the residential use side, um, so the recommendations we've made in summary are one parking space per thousand square feet of, of uh, built space, that is built residential space, or one parking space per unit, uh, whichever is greater. And one question that came up there is, well, what happens if, say, someone has a dinner party, has several friends over, or someone has several overnight guests, even if their household only has one car, which is quite common in this kind of town center condominium living? Um, well, one thing that's important to, to recall is that at build out, the town center plan um, allows approximately 300 residential units and, and change. So that's the <coughs> build out projection. Um, that's a small quantity of parking demand that's generated relative to the overall parking demand in the town center. And as we saw earlier, uh, peak parking demand in the town center tends to occur between noon and one, and parking demand is much lower in the evening. So for example, you see here in um, these results from the shared parking model, Peak parking demand is between noon and one. By the time you get to, for example, nine, 10 o'clock at night, um, parking demand has dropped and it's, and it's down by several hundred parking spaces. So what tends to happen in um, the case of people living in condominium units upstairs from assorted other uses, shops, retail, offices, is that even if they have numerous guests over, there's so much commercial parking available that's not being used because, for example, everybody in the office is, has gone home, that there's plenty of parking available for guests and occasional overnight visitors. And in fact, we see that quite clearly if you go by the Meridian building, um, 
that is in the town center, one of the few examples of um, mixed-use building with residences involved in, in the town center. Um, what we see there is there are uh, 30 condominium units, uh, about 45,000 square feet of space. There are approximately 42 cars that can be attributed to residents and guests, which is about 0.9 vehicles per thousand square feet. That is pretty typical of um, the demand we usually see and in line with the recommendations we've made for parking requirements. And then the other thing we see is that there are 86 commercial parking spaces at that building, which creates a lot of surplus parking, um, especially because many of the uses in that building are, are closed in the evening. Then monitoring and evaluation. One question that came up here was, um, would it be a good idea to add lots more detail on the specifics of monitoring and evaluation to the zoning text amendment? And our recommendation would be that um, that's not a good idea. There are a couple reasons. Um, one is because as a place grows and changes over the years, um, the period of peak demand can change, um, the individual uses can change. Um, and in if, if all aspects of monitoring and evaluation are placed within um, the zoning code, um, it becomes quite inflexible. It also means that um, if you want to change it, even if Planning Commission and City Council are unanimously in favor, because we're in the coastal zone, this would still have to go back to the uh, Coastal Commission for amendment. Um, I'll just mention there are also uh, bicycle parking standards. Uh, we've taken those from uh, standards recommended by the Association of Bicycle and Pedestrian Professionals, and it's for areas that have a quite low bike commute rate, similar to uh, Dandy Point. Finally, uh, signage. That also requires zoning text amendments. And the idea is to make sure that we can have uh, parking signs that are large enough. Um, it will really help with wayfinding, finding some of the secret parking, like some of the parking I mentioned that's hidden behind the Lex building or under the Lex building. And um, one question that came up is um, what, what maximum size is appropriate? One thing that we think is important to keep in mind is that these signs not only need to be used on um, fairly small two-lane streets like Del Prado, but the same signs, or rather other signs, need to be used on Pacific Coast Highway. And because of the speed at which motors travel on Pacific Coast Highway and the setbacks of some of the buildings, the way that some of the buildings are uh, quite a ways up the hill, uh, we think that it's appropriate to have an allowance for signs that are big enough to be visible um, in that case as well, the case for Pacific Coast Highway. And uh, with that, I'm happy to take questions or comments. And before we take those questions, Patrick, could you please clarify that the chart that you presented with the different uh, land uses, the Excel um, chart, that those are derived from the city of Dana Point, that the use mix was, you had an intern go through and take a look at the uses that comprise town center to, to generate those numbers. Yes, ab absolutely. In, in order to prepare the specific shared parking model for the, the town center, what we did is to first go through and inventory every single existing building in the town center. So we added up um, all of the existing buildings. We looked at their square footages and their land use. We um, then subtotaled those land uses into um, categories um, for which the Institute of Transportation Engineers has adopted land use codes and for which considerable uh, parking data is available, including data on demand by time of day. Then we first um, prepared the model, which is based on the Institute of Transportation Engineers data gathered um, nationwide in order to come up with, for example, demand by by time of day. Um, and then we took the existing land use mix in the town center. For example, I believe currently restaurants use about 17% of the non-residential land um, within, or rather building space within the town center. Um, we then said, okay, that's the existing land use mix. Um, and then added 
added the additional square footage that would come with build out of the town center. We also added the additional residential units. Um, one, one thing I should mention there also is that we assumed that there would be no sharing allowed between residential and non-residential. Um, so these, this shared parking model uh, generates somewhat higher demand than it would if you actually allowed for sharing between residential and, and non-residential. Thank you, Patrick. And in closing, I would like to um, remind the commission that the actions before you tonight are for, is a legislative action, so you're acting in an advisory capacity to the city council, that you will be uh, considering a zone text amendment and a local coastal plan amendment. It does not include the parking benefit district, that while Patrick didn't review that this evening, it was uh, quite a bit of discussion at the last meeting. And I just wanna clarify that staff is uh, very much in favor of recommending moving a parking benefit district forward to help prevent spillover parking, because as Patrick did mention in his presentation, adding additional supply will not help that spillover problem. And so there needs to be something implemented to discourage people from parking there to prevent spillover. And the reason it's not before you this evening is because uh, before the city could actually implement a parking benefit district, uh, Title 14 of the Municipal Code, which is not part of your um, jurisdiction, needs to be amended. And so staff is planning on taking that forward to the city council um, with an item relative to parking. So it is part of the parking package and program moving forward. It just doesn't fall under your jurisdiction. Thank you. With that, uh, staff and uh, Patrick are available for any questions. Great. Thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and ask the commission if they have any questions for staff. I do have one. Um, Patrick mentioned that at build out, he was estimating 300 condominiums. Is that, does that concur with what you? That was what was projected in the negative declaration, or sorry, that mitigated negative declaration that was used to uh, analyze the environmental impacts as well as the subsequent EIR that was used as part of the streetscape improvements, the city's plan. And it was, uh, that was uh, the projected number of residential units. Thank you. And then also, what is the existing residential parking requirement? In the Seven. existing code. Simon, do you want to answer that, please? Um, so the existing uh, parking requirements for residential units is based on the number of units, uh, number, I'm sorry, number of bedrooms in each unit. Um, for studios, I believe it's 1.2 spaces. Um, for one bedroom, it's 1.5 spaces. And for two bedrooms, it's 2.2 spaces per unit. And that's for multifamily uh, projects. Thank you. Mm -hmm. As far as the um, shared, the shared space option, shared I'm sorry. As far as the the shared space option, am I not? Just I'm on. Good. I'm a newbie. I think if you just <laughs> let me do it all. <laughs> uh, you, you could just move the mic a little bit closer to your mouth, please. Oh, thank Thanks. you. You don't need. You have. You don't need. Okay. Uh, as the as the town center progress you know begins to ramp up will the shared space already be built there available or will it come along as buildings you know these vacant lots are built on and gradual kind of rolling in we can expect it to evolve <laughs> pardon me um, uh, I would expect the shared parking supply to evolve and expand over time so currently there are about um, 100 off-street shared parking <coughs> spaces in the town center already, um, which is the, at La Plaza. Um, there are informal shared parking arrangements already that we see between different landowners and, and some actually that are written into um, the conditions of approval for various buildings. And um, then what I would expect to see is that um, not only as as new buildings are built, but also as existing uses change with an existing building, that more parking supply will come online. So that can happen in, in several ways. Um, I think the easiest uh, case to consider is, well, what if um, every existing building were torn down, except perhaps a, a 
foreclosed on, and then new buildings were built from scratch. Well, in that case, one option is developers can build to the existing code and keep it private. We expect very little of that. A second would be that they build on-site parking at two parking spaces per thousand square feet and make it public. So that would mean that at build out, you wind up with two parking spaces per thousand square feet, and that should be ample. Um, a third option is that um, they pay in lieu of parking fees of $40,000 per space, and then the city can go ahead and, and bill with road parking. In reality, I would expect this all to evolve over time. The, um, it's very unlikely that, that every building will, will change, um, and certainly new buildings will come on slowly over time. I, I would just add that it's, it's important to understand that developers they want adequate parking for their uses. So it's highly un unlikely and probably impossible that someone would come in with a building and propose all in lieu parking spaces. It may be a situation where, um, let's say they have to provide uh, underground parking and there's uh, three or four parking spaces that they just can't fit on the site without going down a whole nother level. Well, in that case, they might decide to buy in lieu, in lieu uh, instead of building that whole other level. Um, that's it. Thank you. Any other questions from the commission? Okay, I have a few um, real quickly here. And maybe it's staff or um, I'm trying to understand when we look at this reduced parking requirement and the idea that they can count the street parking. It's, it's my understanding when I read through this that the only way you can actually count that street parking is it's really a situation where if they redevelop, their parking becomes public and they're able to use not only the street parking but the public can also park on their side. Is that accurate? Yes, that is, that is correct. Two more questions here. Hold one second. And th th is the city able to lease parking lots today? Is there anything that prevents you from doing that now? No, there's nothing that prevents us from doing that today. And in fact, we are in discussions right now with a property owner and ready to approach a few others. Great, thank you. I think that answers my question. So I, I, I'm gonna go ahead and open the public hearing unless the commission has any other uh, questions. And um, I wanna remind everybody, this is a continued hearing, so we've heard um, I know I was personally at the last meeting and I, I believe the rest of the commission was, was also in attendance. Um, and we're gonna uh, open it up to everybody. If you did speak at that last hearing, we're gonna go ahead and let everybody speak. Um, but we will ask you to hold your comments to three minutes and uh, welcome you up here. So, so just to confirm, um, we're not reopening the hearing. It's still open from the, the last meeting because we uh, continued it. And uh, just for folks, in case they're curious, any comments that were made at the last hearing still continue to be on the record, um, just so you're aware that those comments do carry forward and are on the record. Thank you. So public comments are open. Gotcha. Okay. Can I have uh, Mary, is it Hartsman? Good evening. I'm Mary Hartman. I'm a longtime resident and business owner here in Dana Point. My store is located on the north end of town on PCH, and we, at the present moment, have a severe parking problem. Um, it's impacted with not only um, customers, but employees of the business, d um, various businesses surrounding around me. Um, there's a lot that you need to take into consideration. You know, we bring in more restaurants, that we bring in more people, and everyone has a car, they have to get to work. And, I mean, 2008 was a long time ago, people. Dana Point's changed. Especially with the two ways, we've lost a lot of parking. And also, um, I live in the hood. I live here in the Lantern <laughs> District, and there is a parking problem. I mean, people are jockeying. I mean, I'm, I live in a single family home, a historical home. And when I come home at night, we have to jockey for parking. And I'm two blocks up from PCH. And it's a problem. And I just wanted to be a voice and let you know that I'm really concerned about 
um, having to share our parking that's already so limited with, um, you know, this big town center. And by the way, I'm really excited for Dana Point. I'm not opposed to the great things that are happening in this town. I feel blessed and honored to live here, but I don't want it to lose its beautiful beachy happening charm. So let's, you know, let's keep it cool. All right, thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> uh, Cindy Fleming, please. Good evening. Um, I've got a couple of questions uh, to start with. The, the last hearing, I believe the is that possible? I'm sorry. Yeah, this is not a, a question. This is a question and answer period. This is well, okay. open All right. comments. The last the last hearing, I believe uh, uh, Patrick uh, indicated that of all the cities up and down the coast with mixed use areas the average uh, parking ratio in mixed-use uh, cities was 2.8 per thousand. We're now talking about 2.0 per thousand, which is approximately 30 percent less than the average. So that's a concern. Um, I live in the Lantern District, uh, corner of Ruby and Santa Clara. My office is also in the Lantern uh, downtown area on San Juan Avenue. And um, parking is an issue, and the spillover into the residential in particular is a big issue. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I would recommend that we think very um, hard about keeping with at minimum the average that we're seeing up and down the coast. Um, I am encouraged to hear that the city is at least in discussions on um, leasing parking uh, for the public. Um, that's the first I've heard of that, and so that's nice to hear. Um, it looked to me also, and, and I may not have my numbers correct, that the graph showed a peak parking demand of 1,936 stalls, but if I heard it correctly, the study indicated that currently we have about 1,300 parking spaces in the district. That means we're severely short if that's the case. Um, currently, uh, the city doesn't, has been hesitant to take an active approach uh, on um, taking care of parking issues in residential areas. Um, I believe that four steps could easily mitigate the problems now at little to no cost. One would be to talk to existing businesses. Most of us know who those businesses are that are the biggest problem. Uh, the second would be to uh, have new businesses sign an agreement as a part of their business license to keep uh, their employees and commercial vehicles within the commercial district and encourage their customers to also park within the cur commercial districts. Uh, and then, uh, you know, simple annual or biannual meetings with the businesses, reminders to continue that practice. And then on an active side, sign residential areas with no commercial parking signs. Most people will follow them, I believe. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Mike Powers. Good evening, uh, Commissioners. Mike Powers, I have a business in Dana Point. I live in Dana Point, walking distance to the town center. Uh, also very involved with the town center committee. Uh, we formed the town center committee in December of 2012 to help move the town center plan along. At the time, it was just a plan sitting on a shelf. And with a lot of hard, hard work with the council and mostly the staff, they did exceptional work. We now see what's developing in, t in Dana Point. It's great to see. It's great to see things happening. There's a real buzz around Dana Point. I love it. The last real missing piece is the parking issue, and it's been an issue for a while to make sure that we had a good plan for it. Our committee looked and reviewed very carefully what staff has put together with this parking plan, and we are very much in support of what is in front of you tonight. It is thoughtful. It's based on real data, and it's based on uh, 
similar cities. So w this plan probably will have an easy chance in the Coastal Commission because we're not making something up. We've really reviewed this very closely. Some of the people I've spoken to in town, they are con concerned about it, but most have misinformation. When you read this plan, it is very thoughtful. And I hope that you really take the time and pass this because it is that last step for uh, town center to move forward. The more uncertainty that developers have, the less um, success town center will have. You know, right now, what's in place is not working. We haven't built a significant structure in town center in 25 years. A lot of, lot of empty asphalt out there. We need this town center to grow, and this is really one of the last pieces. Uh, the fact that this plan addresses the excess capacity, and one thing that we really like is the identification of the uh, parking management, both on the residential and within, and it truly is a parking management plan. And it allows monitoring that if things change, further um, uh, requirements can be made to developers. So again, very well thought, thought through, and we encourage you to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Sandy Iverson. Sandy Iverson, Capistrano Beach. Uh, I'm a member of Dana Point's Residence for Responsible Development, and we've gone to every single meeting, uh, past meeting, planning commission, city council meeting, leading up to the decision in November of the approval by three members of the city council only for the Majestic Project. You're looking at 109 condos coming into town center. And they've been handed everything on a silver plate to uh, reduce their parking requirements. And so those buildings are gonna start getting built. We understand there's a, a, a buyer for it and they're going to start construction January 1st or something like that. They've been going around town telling the uh, businesses get ready, uh, January 1st it's coming. So right now we have a problem because they've taken away a lot of spaces on Coast Highway Mary's been uh, seeing the effect of that, the uh, JC Beans next to it. Uh, it's impossible there to get in, get a parking space if you wanna sit down and drink coffee because there's no place along Coast Highway to park. I'm off subject, but what I wanna say is the worst is yet to come and this doesn't address this problem. Nelson Nygaard showed us scenes of private parking lots, not shared parking lots. Those private parking lots are probably gonna remain private. Uh, Luciana's, they're not gonna give up their parking lot for another business's parking at night, that type of thing. So it's all coming, and yet they're only allowing one parking space for a thousand square feet. In a thousand square foot condo, there's bound to be more than one car. One person probably can't afford a $600,000 condo. So you're looking at two people driving two cars and yet the developers only providing, having to provide for one space. It's inadequate. They need to up those numbers and making the developer um, give the parking in their development before it spills over into all the residential neighborhoods, which it's already doing now and these condos aren't even built yet. So it's coming guys, let's get real about it and not rush into this. We don't need this right now. We need businesses on Del Prado to get finished, the, the construction there. We need uh, to know what we're left with, with the parking that's gonna remain there and how businesses are gonna function. Thank you. Thank you very much. Enzo, God, my apologies. I'll get that a lot. All right, thank you. Good evening, um, commissioner, city staff. My uh, name is Enzo Scognamiglio. I own several business in Dana Point, including a restaurant on PCH and a small apartment building right off PCH in town center. And we have no problem at all with parking. Um, I'm here to address you today as the chairman of the board for the Dana Point Chamber of Commerce and board of directors. The Dana Point Chamber of Commerce represents over 400 business in and around Dana Point. I'm here at the request of our board of directors to express our support for the proposed uh, parking management plan. We have reviewed it, the specific of the parking management plan, and we appreciate the city council 
planning commissioner and staff dedicated to this project. Better management of existing parking spaces in the London district is the first step in creating a community friendly district. And that's what we feel is gonna happen. Additionally, we feel that it's important to create a plan that not only supports the need of local residents, but current businesses located in the Lantern District as well. As the voice of the Anna Point business community, we applaud staff proposing solution that works for resident, business, and encourage economic growth in Anna Point. Thank you for your attention tonight. We appreciate the partnership between the city council, city staff, the Anna Point Chamber of Commerce, and our members. Thank you for your hard work. Good night. Thank you, sir. Roxanne Watros. Hello, my name is Roxanna Watros. First, I'd like to welcome you all. Uh, congratulations on your new position. Um, I want to speak today about um, the opportunity you have here. So right now, my opinion, this uh, parking proposal is unfeasible, but the current standards are. And, and the reason perhaps that we have not had the development that we have hoped for is because our city staff hasn't focused on recruiting it. It's like a person who puts a resume on Monster and expects to get their dream job versus the person that goes out and targets the job they want in order to get it. I think in order to get the developments we need, we need to actively pursue the types of businesses and shops and restaurants that we want in our area. And, and I think that's a reasonable approach. What, what I don't think is reasonable, however, is, is having restaurants with only two parking spots. Uh, we, we already have problems with, with parking as is, and I can't imagine any restaurant willing to move into our new district if they were only allotted two parking spots. Our, our planning, um, our what is it? Our town center plan uh, envisioned a walking district, a promenade. Well, how far do you think women can walk in high heels? Because I can tell you, women are the ones that drive all the traffic. Here's an example, exhibit A of my heels. <laughs> I can make it about two blocks, and that's assuming that I get a parking spot right on the promenade. I can't go past that. So I'm literally telling you, and common sense is telling you, that a walking promenade district won't work unless you can get women's high heels right on that promenade. So there needs to be enough parking in the promenade. Um, two, two spots isn't enough for a restaurant. Everybody knows that. Who's gonna get the spots, the chef and a, a waiter? Um, when, it, when it comes to apartment buildings, um, I, can, I can tell you, you know, I'm in my early 30s. I go to visit my girlfriends on the weekends and we roll six or seven deep. That means we're taking up six or seven parking spots at a friend's apartment. That's a lot. Um, if there's only gonna be one parking spot for the resident and no for their co none for their cohabitants and none for the seven or eight guests, where do you think we'll be parking? We're gonna be parking, you know, along the city streets and we're gonna be clogging all the spots or we'll just take up one of the two restaurant spots and nobody gets to eat. I mean, just, just realistically, it, it's unfeasible. But this is your opportunity to make it feasible. Let's keep the standards in place and target the businesses we want. You can get us there and there was a reason the last planning commission didn't vote on this. Take an extra week, talk to the residents. Ma'am, can I ask you to wrap it up, please? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Erica Johnson. Thank you. Um, congratulations to the new commissioners. That's exciting to be involved in your community. Uh, my name is Erica Johnson. I'm a mother of four. You might have seen the baby here before my husband came to get her. Um, I'm an aerobics instructor and I'm the administrative manager for the American Board of Home Care. My husband is a small business owner and we have lived in Dana Point uh, for the last eight years. This is the first time I've spoken at a city council meeting, um, but I chose to come because I feel like this is an important decision in creating and um, the future of our beautiful city. 
think it's been so exciting to see the positive progress that has been happening since 2013 when the construction began. And I feel like the momentum and the interest and the energy has just snowballed for the Lantern District and it's so much that it's tangible. Um, as you know, the original plan was approved in 2006 by the city um, and part of that plan is the, the parking program that's before you tonight. I support the staff parking program proposed because I feel like it will encourage developers who have already signed contracts with our city. Um, they've agreed to terms, they're prepared to meet those terms and I'm afraid that if we change the terms, it's gonna discourage them and other developers from wanting to work here with us to enliven and enrich the Lantern District. I'm afraid that if we lose that momentum that we have going, the vacant lots and the few businesses that we have um, in the area will continue to be an eyesore in what could be a very beautiful and attractive Lantern District. Um, I encourage you to vote in favor of the staff proposed parking program this evening to keep the momentum that we have going to add the charm to our city that I think it deserves and to enrich the area. Thank you. Thank you. Cindy Monroe. Hi, welcome new planning commissioners and city staff. Uh, today you have a unique opportunity to make Dana Point history. Uh, we're at the pinnacle of upward change and you can help us make it great. With your support today, you can help bring new development to our 12 vacant lots faster. In addition to being a Lantern Village resident of 10 plus years, I'm also the owner of a Lantern, uh, Lantern District business, Lux Restaurant, which was referenced in early examples. It's at the corner of Del Prado and Violet Lantern. To start, I'm gonna reference uh, a recent scenario that could reflect the future of Lantern District, the Dana Point Grand Prix of Cycling. At least 50% 50, 50 of my staff and regular customers of whom reside in Lantern Village would normally walk or would they would normally drive to Lux due to the abundant parking they walked or rode their bicycles that day. Additionally, I had several regular customers that live in Niguel Shores and surrounding Monarch Beach communities that took to foot. Many mentioned how great it would be to have our downtown busy like that all the time. Residents in Lantern Village and surrounding communities look forward to walking from place to place within Lantern Village. I overheard so, several of my patrons that might have normally parked and moved their cars from place to place mentioned they were walking down to Stillwater Restaurant, which is an example of shared business and same parking, which is conducive to retail business. This is also reminiscent of my experience with the Dana Point Concert Summer Series where I, along with local friends, rode our bikes and walked to all the concerts we attended. Dana Point will soon have a trolley similar to Laguna Beach that will take people from place to place within Dana Point. This will all also alleviate some of the parking problems that some think we might have. Limited parking is a good problem to have. It is a reflection of a healthy, thriving community. I fully support the proposed parking modifications with the provisions that City Council protect the neighboring residents by author authorizing a par parking benefit district and a preferential parking district to prevent commercial overflow within the residential areas. I understand that is not part of what's being discussed today. I am willing to share my parking with neighboring businesses and I there still five to six hours nightly. <laughs> Dana Point does not have a parking supply problem but rather a parking management problem. Let's approve these modifications today and with proper monitoring, move forward accordingly. Accordingly, Thank you. Thank you. Dana Yarger. Uh, good evening, staff. Uh, everybody's giving you congratulations. I'm also going to offer condolences. You're in a hot spot. Um, my name is Dana Yarger. I live at 24682 Del Prado. Right, I live on the third floor. We have offices on the second floor and retail shops on the first floor. And I think that is sort of the prototype what we're trying to achieve. We bought this building out of foreclosure a few years ago when it was a down. We tried to improve it. In fact, your, your predecessors did say that we did a pretty good job. So we have on the ground, boots on the ground experience, and we want this problem solved. Now, my friends behind me are wondering what I'm going to say. And, and many of them, uh, we, we agree we have a problem. 
We agree that uh, we need a solution to the problem. W I, for one, as a retail merchant in multiple cities, I need customers' access to my business. And it's not just how they spread out over time or convenience. I need them to be able to come when they want to come. So I look for a parking surplus, not a parking uh, potential deficiency. And in the cities where I have had galleries, I'm an art gallery guy, I'm not saying it's the ultimate use, but we try to add some fun and interesting culture to a community. We need, we need this flexibility. In my building alone, with it's only 6,500 square feet, with 20 parking stalls, with one uh, ADA, we have a parking problem. Even the employees in the building fill up that lot. I don't have a place for my customers. If we reduce this, as the plan apparently proposes, I'm gonna have more congestion. So the solution, and I respect all the hard work everybody's doing here, and we all agree it's a problem, I don't know if this is a solution. It seems more an inducement to, actually, somebody on the staff said to me, we want to create the problem. I can't quote the person. We want to create the problem so it forces a solution to the problem. So with a broader base planning, we can maybe get a structure. Maybe we can get something in, in the middle of town. For a year now, people have been talking about where we're going to negotiate uh, um, uh, taking over private property and put some lots. The only one that's happened is Capitol Beach. There's been a lot of talk. I don't know how long it should take. I respect everybody's efforts sincerely. But you guys are in a position. I hope you take, it reminds me of a time when I was in federal court and the judge had just been appointed to the bench and he'd never heard a copyright case. And he said, I need some time. I hope you guys take sincere there's a lot of innuendo here, a lot of rhetoric, some statistics that sort of apply. I hope you come and visit our shop, our gallery. You look at what it is on the ground and see for yourself and really project onto the town center what we really need. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Terry Walsh. Good evening, uh, my name is Terry Walsh, resident of Dana Point, and no, I am not going to show you my shoes. <laughs> so I, I just wanted to point that out in the beginning so that we don't have any uh, expectations here. Um, I like uh, Patrick's uh, plan. I think the shared parking plan is a good one. Uh, it seems to make a lot of sense to me. Uh, I don't know about the arithmetic and the numbers and the graphs. Those are all very intriguing. Uh, but I think that the shared parking idea is a good one. The thing that I'm very concerned about and I hope that you will not adopt tonight is reducing the number of parking spaces required for development. Uh, we heard some discussion at the last meeting and again at this one, we haven't had any construction uh, downtown in 25 years, probably true. Um, when I served on the town center subcommittee, we talked a lot about that and that was the exact reason, perhaps the biggest reason why we formed the town center, center and put together a town center plan was so that we could get something going downtown that we can all be very proud of. And I think uh, it's coming along quite nicely. Um, parking is a huge issue. We talked about it a lot, probably more frequently than building heights and everything else. Um, the, the no development downtown for 25 years, we were told one of the biggest reasons was the prior plan did not permit residential <coughs> on the north side of Del Prado, the post office side, and anywhere on PCH. Huge issue for development, huge issue for pedestrians, because people beget people. So one of the major changes we made, other than two-way traffic and 40-foot building heights, was to permit residential on the north side which of Del Prado and all of PCH. And if you think about it, there is no residential there today. We have on the south side of Del Prado, um, but not on the north side. Huge change. So the notion and the innuendo that somebody mentioned earlier that we haven't had any development for 25 years is kind of due solely to this parking issue. And if we could just solve this one little, one little glitch, suddenly the town center will take off with development uh, big time. Well, quite frankly, I think the town center is taking off with development big time. We heard about the Meridian Project huge project, which coincidentally is gonna be on Pacific Coast Highway. I, I see development on Pacific Coast Highway today. Uh, uh, Mr. Fowler put out a report showing probably 10 or 12 projects that are either approved or in the works already using existing parking standards. 
I haven't seen enough data yet to support the notion that we should reduce the number of parking spaces. So I strongly suggest, for development, I strongly, strongly suggest that you adopt Patrick's plan. Let's implement it. Let's get the shared parking thing going. Let's demonstrate to the community that we can actually have parking downtown. And then in the future, perhaps we can reduce the requirements for development. Thank you. And I can't read the first name, last name's Ray. Sorry about that. Good, good evening, gentlemen. My name is George Ray. I'm a uh, resident uh, of Dana Point, as well as I have an office in Capitol Beach, uh, 26875 Kai Hermosa. I'm here to support the plans that are presented to the Planning Commission today. Uh, I do that first as an individual, but also I have to inform you that I'm representing a development that spoke before the Planning Commission in a study session several months ago for the development of a mixed-use project at PCH and Golden Lantern. Um, it was a project that would be approximately 39 unfinished, uh, unfurnished residential apartments and about 7,800 square feet of retail development. Uh, I will speak a lot to basically the, the retail side of it because that is my expertise and experience. I've been vice president of real estate for Lucky Stores and a regional manager for Home Depot, as an example. So I'll, I'll address my comments to that, which I can represent and, and have knowledge of. As an example, our project they're proposing would have a cafe of approximately 2,500 square feet and a uh, uh, polished casual restaurant of about 3,500, give or take a few, and a small retail, probably a, sm a small bank, Union Bank, would stay in the project and, and stay there too. The parking requirement for that was 50 parking spaces. As an example, the cafe that we're talking about is a morning use. It's not going to be residential. It's in the morning. Basically, we're perfecting you know, coffee and maybe a safer lunch. The polished casual restaurant may open for lunch, but they're primarily a dinner. And of course, the bank closes. 5 o'clock to 6 o'clock during the week. Well, we have to have 50 parking spaces for that. That's just an overburdened amount of parking that we'd require for that retail. Residentially, we would have, I think, approximately 60. Uh, uh, but in what is occurring here is, is, is that there is the ability to develop the underground parking sounds really good. It's also, given the size of the lots, very, very expensive and very difficult to finance. We had at least one project I know stopped maybe the uh, Majestic Project is going forward. Uh, uh, that is news to me, but that may be brand new. So I just simply want to indicate that we do support that. I think it's a viable use. I think all you have to do on an anecdotal basis is look to uh, uh, San Clemente. I mean, you're talking about uses that have got tremendous amount of retail. They have a lot of programs. They have a lot of shared parking and off-site parking, and it all works for people who drive. Uh, lastly, as an example, Home Depot they used to require 500 par parking spaces for their big stores. They got, you know, 2,000 stores. They're now down to 2.5 2 per thousand. So they've even recognized that shared parking and parking demands are down. Thank you. Thank you. Trent Hofferberg. Hoff Hofferberg. Or boy, I'm really butchering it up tonight, aren't I? It's Hofferberg. Hofferberg. Good evening, commissioners. Um, well, I would like to speak to one issue, and uh, the previous person spoke to that as well, but we are, um, we operate a business on San Juan Avenue, which is uh, two doors from the, the, the project that Golden Lantern in San Juan. Uh, San Juan Avenue is totally maxed out for parking if you are there any other day but Monday. Monday, the Peking Dragon restaurant is closed. So there is, there is parking on that street. Any other day from noon on, there is no parking. It's gone between the Harbor House Cafe and the Peking Dragon. Our parking lot at the office, since we've lost parking on Coast Highway, is maxed out. So you go around the block hunting for a parking place to get to your own office. And there, there's nobody, we have, we have uh, four businesses in the building. There's nobody there in the building that has multitudes of clients coming in and out. It's, it's minimal. Uh, and yet, just the people there can hardly find a place to park after 12 in, in the daytime 
on Tuesday through Saturday, or Tuesday through Friday, uh, we do have shared parking with the restaurant, which doesn't particularly work too well. It's supposed to occur in the evening, but it occurs all the time. So there are pros and cons with shared parking unless you have an agent out there monitoring who's going in there and when. And uh, so that, that's another management item to take care of. But the, uh, the San Juan um, issue is, is maxed at the moment. So any additional restaurants in that area are going to, I don't know what that will happen, but it's, it's not great. But that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you. Bob Thiel. Good evening, my name is Bob Thiel. I'm a resident of Dana Point. Congratulations, new planning commissioners. And good evening, good evening, staff. Um, I had some prepared comments, but I heard a few things tonight, so I want to address those things because I think they're relevant. We've had two projects that have been approved in town center. One is the advent project at Violet Lantern and Del Prado. I know the developer, or the owner of the property. He designed his project, got approval, and it's two and three quarter stories of underground parking. Doesn't Excuse me, I hate to interrupt. I'm sorry, this is, I'm sorry. Excuse me? This is not a discussion. Please. Go ahead, Bob. Um, I know that project, I know the developer. It's parked according to what the standards are. He tells me it doesn't pencil out. He's trying to recapitalize the project. He's got a problem. The Majestic project, two levels of underground parking in all three of their phases. I had a partner, a development partner, 10 years ago. We did a, a, a nice deal. They're on the New York Stock Exchange. They have an urban land division. I took the Majestic project to them and said, let's take a look at this, guys, and see if we can make sense of it. They got their urban land group in. We ran the numbers. We spent about three weeks working on this thing. They came back and said, Bob, we're sorry. We can't come into Dana Point on this project. It doesn't make any sense at all. It doesn't pencil out. The parking is too much. The uh, excavation, the shoring, and so on to create the parking doesn't make it work. So I just want to make those comments. And I hope I have enough time to get through my other comments here. The, the vision of the town center is that we want to have continuous shops, shop after shop after shop, eating place, restaurants, uh, shopping, spontaneity as, re as our uh, pedestrians go up and down the nice sidewalks we have. Instead, what we have now is something that doesn't even compare to that. We have a suburban, sporadic uh, grouping of buildings along our sidewalks. Uh, the planners call it disjoined incrementalism. And what we have here is a problem that we would like to solve with having new development come in and fill in all of these interruptions between the shops that we have. The interruptions are parking lots, uh, retaining walls, vacant lots, um, buildings that don't have front doors that address the sidewalk. It's a mess. We want this, that to be solved, and that's what the vision is. The problem with this is that we've got obsolete suburban parking standards that we've had for over 25 to 40 years. And it is a fact, no new building on PCH in town center uh, has been constructed in 25 years since we've been incorporated. And we got incorporated so we could control our land use. The parking standards is the culprit, that's the problem. The solution is a parking management plan that's carefully thought out this has been carefully thought out. I read, read through it a few times. I got a few problems with it, but by and large, I think it works. And it's a fluid parking management problem. It's not something that's static. Once it's adopted, that's it, it's over. They've got policies that where they review it, they analyze it, they get further input, and, and you go with that flow. So I'd like to see you adopt the uh, parking management plan this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Frost. <clears throat> Good evening, Planning Commission. My name is Michael Frost. I live in the Lantern Village also. I, uh, I'm just a resident. I don't own commercial property, not a developer. Of course, I'm also not anti-development, which is there's certainly some in here that are. 
I'm coming you from uh, from purely a residential perspective. I do believe the town center is transformational, uh, both specifically for the Lanner Village, but also Dana Point as a whole. I am behind this plan, uh, parking plan. I'll tell you why. Um, the the PowerPoint that Patrick presented, it's it basically said what we all know, or anybody who who's in the in the town center quite a bit knows. Number one, we've got tons of extra spaces. Number two, we do have some pockets where there are problems, but overall we have tons of extra spaces. I can t I'll, I can tell that when I go to eat at the Schwack tonight. Um, number three, we have. Um, we do have some residential or some flow to the residential areas, which I deal with. I actually live on Amber Lantern and La Cresta. Um, the, uh, the areas immediately adjacent to the town center do fill up quite a bit. In my mind, looking at the PowerPoint and then looking at um, uh, the proposed uh, parking plan, you c all seven or five or seven uh, policies work towards that. Number one, uh, sh the shared parking. Um, Actually, I would I would think maybe all non-residential uses sh should be shared parking. I, I I know you can't require that, but that makes perfect sense to me. Um, number two, better signage and better management of the spaces we do have. Um, I I can't tell you how <laughs> tonight we'll go. Th if anybody drives through the town center, it's going to be wide open. I'm telling you, and then there's going to be some spots where it's completely packed. So better management is going to solve that. Um, I also think in order to encourage development, I don't know why we would have um, unrealistic parking expectations. If we are able to better manage the parking we do have, let's lower that. Let's, let's, in, let's incentivize development and people spending, investing in our community as long as we're able to better manage what we have now. And then also the parking, uh, parking let's see, benefit district and then also the preferential parking plan. In my mind, actually, I'd like to see those things implemented ASAP. Uh, those are immediate benefits to the residents. So I, overall, I, I'm not a developer, not a commercial property owner, just a resident who wants to see town center succeed. I think these policies are straight down the middle, and they make sense for any reasonable community member. Thank you. Thank you. Jim Miller. Good evening, welcome aboard, guys. Um, <coughs> my name is Jim Miller. I'm a resident of Dana Point. And um, for some of you who may not know this, but um, I've been working on developing the harbor for the last 17 years. And we're still working on the problem. Hopefully, maybe in the next five years. It's been a five year plan for the past 15 years, so we'll see. <laughs> I don't want Town Center to become an eight year plan for the next eight years. <coughs> you know, I th and I think that's really important. I was a member on the town center subcommittee, and parking was a hot, uh, dis highly discussed issue. And it was th at that point we realized that parking was going to be what makes town center work. If your people can't park and the developers can't build, nothing's going to get built. And that is what's happened in the past 25 years. Developers can't build because they can't meet the parking requirements. And we thought by doing the plan for town center that was going to resolve that problem. And here we are today still fine-tuning and tweaking it. And I think that's what we have to do. But we can't take another eight years to make this work. I think the proposed parking plan we have today is a good start. <coughs> it, will, it will test the time. Will it take the test of time? Absolutely not. Will it have, will it have to be changed? Absolutely will. But I think it's a start, and I think that's what you have to get going with. Because if you keep bannering it around and come up with a plan, you'll wind up back at the plan we have today, which doesn't encourage development. So you've, you've either got to move forward or be happy with what you've got. Um, <coughs> so I hope that we don't turn this into a 17-year or 18-year project like I'm living down the harbor. Also, I, I think the most uh, important part of this plan that's probably not addressed by you tonight is the uh, spillover parking. I think that's a, a serious concern in the plan. And I have done some research on this, and I do believe that some of the ideas that are being floated around uh, for the parking benefit plan on the water side of Del Prado 
and for the preferential parking plan for the land side of PHH will really work to give the residents uh, some ease of mind that we will have a parking considerations for them and not overpack them with the development of town center. All that being said, I think it's time to move forward and let's not make it an eight year plan. All right, thank you. Thank you. Patty Short. Good evening, commissioners and staff. My name is Patty Short. I'm a resident of David Point, uh, and I moved here in 1980. When Del Prado was two-way, and so was Coast Highway, but they ended at Golden Lantern. There was no access to the harbor other than coming in on what is now Dana Point Harbor Drive. And I think what a lot of this argument is about is change. People are very, very reluctant to accept change, but change is what makes us grow, and we need to continue to grow. As far as the current parking program is concerned, um, it's a pain. I happen to be a real estate agent, and I've had some experience in the recent past where I was trying to put a client into a building, and because of the parking requirements, although this client had her and one other person, because of the par current parking requirements, it took us about six weeks to get her into the building. We managed to do it, but it was all based on use and size. So I think you've come up with a fabulous plan. I encourage you to move forward with it. And since this is the third time that we've tried to have a town center, let's really do it this time. Thank you. Thank you. Susan Hinman. Chairman Nelson and Honorable Commissioners, I'm Susan Hinman. I'm a longtime resident of Dana Point. In fact, the, the residential commercial use was one that the Dana Point Specific Plan Board of Review put on the books when, before incorporation, that, and that's something that, as a member of that committee, I thought was a good idea, and we wanted to see that move forward. I have some concerns, though. Um, I'm just wondering if you really looked at the demographics of Dana Point and to see if what you're proposing parking-wise is going to fit in with what the residents really need. We're talking about 300 condos. And we're talking about lots of restaurants. Is this something that our residents will really profit from, will they really, or are as taxpayers, or is this going to cost them? What happens with one of the lots uh, that you've been used, that the city has decided to use for parking? What happens when that lot is sold? Who pays for additional parking to be made available? And what is that cost to the Dana Point taxpayers? I'm very concerned about this. I'm very concerned about two parking places for a thousand feet in a restaurant. It just it doesn't seem realistic. As we travel, my husband and I travel up and down California. Uh, we were in Alameda uh, last weekend. We've been in Santa Cruz recently. We've been in Los Gatos. We, of course, spent a lot of time in San Clemente. And I'll tell you, there are some of those cities that you go through are so impacted, I will never go back because it's so unpleasant because of the parking and the congestion. Is that what we want? I really want you to think about this because I, I know the parking regulations can be a real pain, but if people who are 70, want to go out to dinner, and they have to walk four blocks, are they going to go to town center? So uh, please think about those things. I, I really, I, I'm very, very concerned about the lack of potential parking. Thank you. Buck Hill. I was banned before I talked. You know, for the sake of Having this completely wide open, and why don't you just come up and, and speak? Much. I appreciate the consideration. Uh, I just have a few points to make. This 
Currently, parking has been decided based on uh, code section 935.080. And this proposal reduces the basic requirement by 56%. So it's not like a small change, it's a huge change. Uh, beside that, this idea of, of giving credit for the street spaces is a huge effect. Uh, there are something like 600 street spaces here and as we give credit to a developer to use the spaces on the streets around his property, if, it, if all of those 600 were given to some developer at $40,000 a space, that's $24 million given by the taxpayers and, and citizens of Dana Point to these developers as a, con as a consideration to attract them. I think that's a huge number that doesn't make any sense at all. To me, those spaces are public property and they should remain public property and public space. Uh, the staff views that you've been given here, I don't think they're supported with the data, as I mentioned once before. For example, that chart, it's been shown on the board, but I can't find it in anything that's available to analyze. What is the build out? How many square feet of each of these types of buildings is planned? How many parking spaces are linked to those buildings? And, and is it really a full build out? Is that 10 years from now? 15 years, you haven't mentioned the date or the, um, you know, how you got to those numbers. I don't think it's fair to ask you commissioners to make decisions without some data that you can look at. It's like approving the plan without a vision of, without even being able to see the blueprint. That's why I was crying about data. And I, if you've seen it, then I applaud you, but I wish it were made available publicly because we haven't had a chance to critique it from the other side. I think I'll, I'll limit it to that. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. And seeing no other comment cards, I'm gonna go ahead and close the, the is it the public hearing or the public comment period? You're gonna close the public hearing. Okay, I'm gonna close the public hearing and um, turn it over to my fellow commissioners unless there was anything specifically uh, addressed during the public comments that staff felt like they need to deal with or questions to answer. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a few questions that I did want want to clarify, um, I did want to start off by saying that a parking management problem feels very much like a parking supply problem. You, as a customer coming to the town center area, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. It feels the same. There are some spot shortages and sometimes you might not be able to um, find a spot um, particularly close by to the particular business you want to go to and there's some spillover parking. But by identifying as a parking management problem, what it does is it tells us what set of tools are going to really help solve this problem. And so I think that's a, an important distinction. And um, the, the solution is in parking management policies as opposed to bringing on additional supply. And a case in point on that, I was talking to a merchant just earlier today who mentioned at um, their peak lunchtime hour on a Saturday, he can look across the street and see 13 available parking spots on any given Saturday at the peak hour, yet he will continually get some spot, um, some spillover parking complaints from adjacent residences. And it's important to note that because there's already the supply there, adding more supply isn't going to fix that spillover problem and that's actually been evidenced in the recent um, Meridian building analysis that RBF did as well, that there was sufficient supply, but there was some spillover parking. And so again, I'd just like to iterate that staff is very much in support of the traditional residential parking district that would be on the inland side of the couplet, as well as the parking benefit district that would be on the water side of the couplet in order to manage those spillover parking situations. I did want to um, add that the, there was a, a concern that 2.8 per thousand was the average along the coast, and that's not correct. That was one of the outliers. In fact, that was an outlier on the very high end. There were, there were two communities. One was at 2.6, one was at 2.8, but the majority of the data showed that it was on average 1.4 to 1.8, and there were outliers on the other end as well at even less than one um, space, occupied space per thousand square feet. So I did want to clarify, clarify that. Uh, also, there was um, an indication that the graph showed a peak parking demand of over 1,900 spaces. That's not today, that graph was at build out. So it was taking the existing uh, land use makeup 
by percentages, so whatever exists today of resident, residential, OPEX, et cetera, and projecting that out at full build-out, there was a, a demand of, of 1,900 spaces. Um, and then I did want to mention that if a parking lot is leased, the city is sort of paying as you go. Um, there would be, we, we wouldn't be prepaying those lease agreements. So if somebody opted out, we would only have paid for the parking as long as we were able to lease that parking lot and get the benefit of having that be public parking. Once somebody decides to sell their lot and no longer lease that parking to the city, those funds that had been budgeted for that parking are now available to go lease some other parking lot. Um, and I just wanted to ensure that um, any public on-street parking would remain public parking and it would be continue to own be owned by the public and in fact that can only be counted under the new proposal <coughs> if the applicant the developer is willing to in turn make their on-site parking public as well um, so there is actually you could argue an exaction that the city is getting from um, the development community in that case there is a public benefit of getting additional public parking spaces um, and that's all and was there any other questions Great, thank you. Well, I think before we start discussing, I want to go on record as commending the staff on taking the time, at least with me, I won't speak on behalf of, the f of my fellow commissioners, but getting us up to speed. Um, I know I took uh, a lot of time to read through the documents that I got, but the time that I spent with staff going through my questions um, and then watching the videos going all the way back to the joint committees um, really kind of got me up to speed uh, fairly quickly and wanted to to thank you for your time for that and um, turn it over to you guys and see if you want to discuss anything. Thank you. Um, I guess before I begin, I have a couple questions for Brad. Uh, Brad, is, what's the net on-street parking change in the couplet as a result of the Reconfiguration. Uh, <coughs> the net change is is basically even. I think we ended up with four more spaces, and <coughs> we lost some parking spaces on PCH, but we gained some when we. Uh, f and this is goes back to starting when we did the original environmental analysis. We added uh, spaces on uh, San Juan, and we're getting a lot more spaces on Del Prado. So overall, in the town center, you're ending up with the same amount of parking spaces, but you've lost some at this time on PCH with us expanding to four lanes on PCH. On Del Prado, where we're going down to two lanes, you're gaining more parking there where by we're taking out driveways and a lot of the red marked areas for sight distance that go along with driveways. So you're getting more parking there. Um, <coughs> Thank you. Also, as, as individual parcels on PCH develop, they're going to be required to dedicate and widen PCH to allow additional on-street parking that's not there today. Is that correct? That's correct. Because, and, and that's important, uh, that w people, you know, when we did the street improvement project, Originally, we recognized that we could do Del Prado today to where we wanted it in the future, but PCH we can't because we have private property that encroaches right up to the property line. As new properties develop, they are required to dedicate uh, the 10-foot setback back to the city for public use. So, for example, in the <coughs> Majestic uh, property, they, uh, on Amber Lantern, at PCH, um, they will cut back into their property, set back, so that seven parking spaces will be returned to PCH with that development. And that was not um, credited to the developer either, as a matter of fact. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's an important point to understand. Um, I have a handful of comments, certainly. I, too, would like to thank staff and um, the previous planning commissions and all others who have had a role in massaging and developing and uh, and pushing this forward to where it's at now. Um, 
like Commissioner Nelson, I also had a chance to meet with staff. Um, I believe we all attended the previous, well, while we weren't commissioners, we attended the, the previous commission and heard all the comments and the presentations at that time. Uh, had an opportunity to read all the documentation and so forth and so as well get up to speed and I know that there's so much that's been done before we you know we're kind of Johnny come lately to the party so um, but I do feel like you know we've certainly had a chance to become well versed on the issues and I appreciate all that's been done there uh, I'd like to mention that this is very much a revisable document. As time goes on, as the conditions change, as parking becomes in higher demand, it will be revisited uh, on an annual basis. Um, and it would, it's certainly easy to, you know, pick apart, you know, pick at some of the details of, of this and say, well, I'm unsure about this, or I'm unsure about that, or I don't like this, or I'm concerned about that. But the big picture needs to be considered as well. And this plan has been, was separated out from the original approval of the town center plan back in 2008. The parking was like a player to be named later. It was to be considered later and, and that later is now seven years later. So um, I wanna take that into consideration. One thing that I, I do have concerns about is Patrick mentioned the idea of parking fiefdoms the the individual private property lots which which show up as you know either fully parked or, or, or not parked or partially parked and yet they're not available to the general public so uh, and I'll summarize my recommendations at the end but uh, one of the things I'm going to recommend is that there's been talk of a of a reevaluation when an 80 percent um, occupancy trigger has been triggered. Uh, that that be 80% of available public parking spaces so that the, the, the private spaces that are off limits to someone looking for a space aren't counted in that trigger. Uh, with respect to uh, parking rates, um, you know, rates per thousand square feet or, or what, what, what it may be, um, it's my strong feeling that developers will supply and design into their projects the amount of spaces that they feel. So, for example, if the parking requirement is one per thousand square feet on residential, but that the developer feels, hey, I'm not going to be able to sell or lease my units at that kind of rate, people are going to be concerned about it, that they will provide more that that's just a minimum. I recognize that this is a very important time for Dana Point and the uh, Lantern District Plan, and I rec recognize that there are many people with, with very passionate positions about it. Um, I'm in favor of the, uh, the two parking districts. Uh, the preferential. I understand, I acknowledge that we're not voting on it tonight, but um, I am in favor of, <coughs> of protecting the residential areas with the preferential parking district and the uh, benefit parking district as well. Um, so with that being said, I have some specific recommendations. In general, I'm in favor of the plan, and I think it's to be commended. Um, but I do have some specific things that I'd certainly like to hear the thoughts of the other commissioners on. Um, one is the, the discussion of the $40,000 in lieu fee. I think that a more robust analysis needs to be done to support and justify the dollar figure. I think that could be a fine dollar figure for, for the purposes of, of starting out, but that like I say, a more robust analysis should be done, you know, beginning immediately on that. I know that that's envisioned in the, in the documentation to review it in the future, but I think the analysis should be undertaken now. Uh, like I mentioned, with respect to reconsideration, I think the 80% trigger 
for reconfiguration sh or reconsideration and revision should be when 80% of the available to the public spaces are, are full. With respect to the residential parking rates, and this may get a little bit complicated, hopefully not, um, I'd like to gauge the other commissioner's opinion of saying, okay, if, the, if it's a studio or a one-bedroom place, we can leave it at the you know, one minimum or one per thousand square feet. If, if a residential unit is two or more bedrooms, that we consider recommending 0.7 spaces per bedroom. So for example, a two bedroom place, you know, then their calculation would include for that carve out of space, 1.4 units, uh, uh, 1.4 parking spaces. And then that would be combined on a blended rate for the whole overall project. I think my opinion is one per thousand if there's multiple bedrooms, it just might not be adequate. So that, that's something that we should consider. And that's my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't come into this with the same backgrounds of my two wonderful colleagues here. Um, but in order to get up to speed, for all of this, other than living here and loving it and you know, walking everywhere, uh, I went back and looked at all the documents I could find, all the history I could find, starting from 1989, working on up. Of course, uh, we've all, most of us knew what data point looked like before. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I have a cold, it's a little hard. Um, so it was, it was my intent to learn as much as I could about the issues and um, what m would be the best possible outcomes for these projects. And you know, we've all looked, we're so long about <coughs> those 14 <coughs> vacant lots um, in the town center district, we've seen, you know, no, in fact, you, you, every year you'd wonder, well, is the, the Christmas tree lot going to be there or there or there? <laughs> so it was important to me to do my due diligence and not only talk to staff, and they've been just wonderful, they've been open and answered any questions that I have, um, but to get familiarize myself with the city government, the codes, um, the ordinances, <coughs> which is, I'm a lawyer, so I like to do that anyway. <laughs> it, it's, but I, I come to, I, I kept coming back to the same issue, remembering that we are not the legislative body the city council and the, the um, mayor consist of the legislative body for the city of Dana Point. And we're, we're as a commission, we're, we're acting as an advisory capacity. And in order to be good at that, I think we've all tried our very best to learn as much as we could. And we've heard from so many speakers from so many, coming from so many different directions. I have a couple of questions, a couple of issues in that I do also have concerns about the Santa Clara parking as well as the parking that is adjacent to um, Pacific Coast Highway as it runs up. Um, I, I hear that, I, I, I feel the pain, I hear the pain, I hope that there will be some good resolutions to that. And, and I know that we've, staff has talked to us about the potentials for that. Uh, you know, of course we have the Coastal Commission um, to work with uh, being on the, the coastal zone. 
so I'm trying to look at this in, in the whole of, of what's gone on and the history. There's always going to be competing interests. That we, we know that. The town center, as far as I can see, the town center plaza, which was adopted years ago, established a, the framework, as we've been talking, um, for the public improvements and to support private reinvestment and development and rebalancing town center to encourage pedestrian friendly and car friendly, especially if you're in heels, um, <laughs> for all of our visitors and our residents. And, and I feel that there has been a lot of good thought and work put into that. I think that these are issues that have not been taken lightly. lightly. Uh, certainly, it, it appears that while there has to be compromise, everybody, particularly on staff and Patrick, have worked hard to try and come up with the solutions that will best suit us as we go forward and as we get into 20 years from now and 30 years from now. And the devil is in the details. You know, you bring it all down and we're always gonna have the devil in details, like the little, the, the parking issues. But at this point in time, I think we have to broaden the scope and look at this from a wide perspective. Excuse me. Patrick, I had one, one question. In response to the gals coming to town in several cars, how far would one have to walk? Let's say if you, I mean, before one could find a parking, shared parking area that would be suitable for a number of cars. So if we, if we think of a, a typical situation where people are all dressed up going out at night, um, it, it's clearly going to vary. Um, for example, I'll go back to the case of the Meridian building and, and the Lush restaurant. Um, we know that there, there's ample parking right literally underneath the, the restaurant um, and literally right behind it, which goes underused. Um, in that case, I think it's, it's a matter of stepping out of the car, walking 50 feet to the elevator and going upstairs. Um, and with the right protection for the adjacent residential area and the right signage um, and the um, gen generally the combination of both public and private signage, I would expect that problem to be, that spillover problem to be solved and there'll be ample parking on site. Um, in other cases, I certainly think you can see places, especially some of the historic buildings uh, mm -hmm. Luciana's restaurant, for example, is in a historic building um, where the choice is between, well, do I spend a few dollars on valet parking or maybe whoever took you out spends a few dollars on val valet parking um, or indeed you, you walk a few blocks. Um, I'll just say um, if, you, if you go some places, you, you see um, people going out at night, they're wearing their flats on the way to the, to the club and when they reached the club, they change into towering high heels and somehow managed to, to dance in them. Um, <laughs> so the, es essentially what I would say is that um, the one thing I do know is that we see um, similar districts all over California with very similar uh, parking standards and that mix of parking solutions from uh, valet parking to on-site. And these are really popular places to go just because they're great places to be. Well, I am in favor of the project. <coughs> I, I do have perhaps a little bit of a caveat. Um, and I think 
as I mentioned, I, I would like if we should send this up to the council, I would, I would like there to be some more concrete, well, I don't know if you can get concrete with the Coastal Commission, but more of an idea of what might occur for the residential, the adjacent residential parking issues. Great, thank you. Well, um, you know, I think staff's, I know staff's done a great job here. I'm, I've read through this entire plan, and, and the one thing that, um, that continues to, to um, come out is that what you've really done is bookended a plan that was approved years ago. I, I think there was a comment earlier tonight that this is, and I wrote it down, one of the most important decisions or the biggest decisions that we may make up here. And, and while I appreciate that, I want to believe that I am sitting up here making really big decisions. I know that we got here tonight because of a lot of other decisions that got made. And the decision that we're making tonight is really a recommendation to move something to the next step. Um, and the council still has to work through the issues. Um, I'm, I'm at, I am in support of the plan. I do have um, a question in regards to the monitoring of the public parking. Um, how many public, public parking spaces do we currently have now? In the neighborhood of 650. Okay, so 80% of, I can't do that kind of math in my head. So we, five, so, it, so, so you're, you're asking uh, to get behind this, you know, if, if I heard you, that you want to make sure that we're monitoring that, that parking? Or do you want to, because I, I don't want to avoid monitoring all the parking and limit it to public. So I want to be a little, make sure I'm really clear on what your suggestion would be. I appreciate that. Um, my my suggestion or, or concept is this. There's what Patrick called parking fiefdoms. And so if those are there and the spots are available, but they're under the threat of towing by signage, people are not going to want to park there unless they are really pressured to do so because <laughs> they just can't find anything else. So if someone is going to go out and try and find a space and there's, let's call it 650 available parking spaces, but when uh, available to the general public, now they might go to an individual restaurant or establishment that, and park within their lot, right? But in general, the available to the public spaces are the 650 without designating one specific use or location. So. What I'm saying is that, yes, the public and the private can be monitored, but as a trigger for, th they've talked about a trigger for reevaluation at 80% parking occupancy. And what I'm saying is that they should consider, and I think it will be hit, reached before an overall global parking occupancy of 80%, 80% parking occupancy of the public available spaces w should be the trigger to then you know, reevaluate and see what can be done. Does that, have I clarified? Yeah, I'm just, I'm trying to think through how to monitor that if they're, what, what are we using to measure that? Are we using it when it's just the street parking in front of the businesses that are uh, providing public parking and being allowed to use that street parking? Are we talking the, the individual lots? That's, that's a question better answered for Brad, I think, but I, I think it starts with the street parking, and then if there are any shared parking spaces available that have become available through either city leasing or private property owners making their, proper, their parking spaces available into the shared parking program, any shared space that's allowed for any member of the public to go and park in. Okay, makes sense. Is this from a technical standpoint, you could monitor both at the same time and then have a readout on your public space parking usage and your private space parking use usage. And then you could evaluate it because um, we do see in, in talking with businesses, a lot of people kind of have shared arrangements informally already. So, you know, and frankly, you're not seeing uh, some of these businesses tow people 
for coming into their space, particularly if they have a shared parking arrangement. So while I, I see the logic in what you're saying, I would also add that there's places where that shared parking is already a, a, an agreement between parties. So just looking at the public is probably not giving a full picture either. So we, we, could, we could do both. Great, okay. And, and then the other thing I think, Patrick, quick question for you. These are, are minimum requirements, not maximum, right? So if I'm a developer and I wanna build a new housing development, and I don't have to, to only give them one space. I could give them, I could build four parking spaces. It really depends on the market and the developer and. Um, uh, yes, ab absolutely. The, what we've proposed here is minimum requirements. Um, there's no maximum any, any developer or property owner is allowed to build as many spaces as they wish. Um, I suppose the, the only limits are that there are certain urban design uh, rules in the, <coughs> in the plan about where parking can go on a lot. But generally, you can build as many spaces as you want. Okay. And um, that was the only question that I had regarding that. As it relates to the in-lieu fees, can you just walk me through quickly how you ended up at that number? We, we took a look at, at several things. Um, first, we, we took a look at the typical <coughs> cost per space to build structured parking you know, in California, um, and in, in particular in similar coastal communities with small lots. Um, we took a look at land values currently in the town center, um, and we took a look at um, the, the situation in, in terms of having to either assemble or purchase uh, lots in order to, to put parking on them. And so from that, we found generally without doing an exhaustive real estate study um, that 40,000 looked to be the, the right ballpark. Now what I would say is that we put in this um, plan a recommendation that that be reviewed and adjusted annually and um, certainly it could make sense to go back and do a more, more detailed um, uh, study of that. One thing that I would say is, of course, it interacts together with the parking requirements. So for example, I know some communities, they left in place very high minimum parking standards, which frankly were excessive for the situation, um, but then wound up setting very, very low um, in lieu of parking fees. So it's that combination of what's the fee and what's the, the requirement. Gotcha, okay. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm at, as I said, I'm in favor of this. I certainly understand your concerns. Um, as it relates to the residential parking, um, I'm open to, to discussing a little bit more about the count. I, I do believe that the market drives those spaces more than anybody else. Um, and I'm, I'm always cautious of getting in and nitpicking the details but uh, I'm certainly not opposed to walking through a few things, but I wanna get behind this and move this forward. I think there's been a lot of work, good work that's gone into putting together a great plan and, and I wanna be part of moving this forward tonight. So did you? Take one, one, one more comment. Oh. Um, there's been a lot of, of discussion about the sacrifices that people have been making, the merchants, the restaurants, you know, the homeowners along the edges of the town center development. And this has been going on for years and they have been, we all know that. And we see it and we, we also recognize it's tough. Saying that, maybe we do wanna move this thing forward just as fast and safely and correctly as we can do it so we can get this town into the position that we all want it to be and take the burden off of the merchants and the restaurants and the residents along Del Prado and the other areas. So um, that's what I have to say. Great. Anybody wanna make a motion? I guess I have a question then for, I mean, if we wanna talk about the residential rates a little bit more, directed either to Ursula or Patrick. Um, I asked earlier, 
And um, Sama responded with, what, uh, what, what are the existing rates in the for residential? And the existing rates were based on bedroom count. And in the new proposed, it's based on square foot. So, and I'm saying, hey, I'm fine with square foot up to and including a one bedroom, but two bedroom and up, maybe we should consider a per, per bedroom rate. What comments would you have on that or light would you want to shed? <coughs> I guess I would just say that the one per thousand is more in line with occupancy that's been found in the field, um, as Patrick has shared with us. It's sort of similar to the two per thousand. So currently many cities have this, you know, suburban parking standards that, and, and we've gone through the slides that where that data came from, um, ITE went out and surveyed and they said, oh, well, we want to look at the maximum conditions and they came up with these standards. And so residential parking standards is arguably is a, s a similar sort of scenario. And so going to the two per thousand, that's based on occupancy data and that is where the one per thousand comes from. Um, Patrick had said one point in time they found it to be more accurate in terms of what is the actual demand required from residential in these types of environments where you're not largely moving large families to, to these types of units. Th there might be some, but there's gonna be a lot of singles and et cetera, and so it seems to be a valid number. And we did go out and spot check into um, existing cases where we have a mixed use project and another. That being said, staff feels comfortable with that recommendation for those reasons. It is ultimately, um, if you, know, you all decide to want to do something different, it's you're the ones that get to vote. I, f I feel good about what I proposed. I don't. I'm open to discussion on it. It's, can you just walk me back through what your come what your proposal was? So, w what my proposal was was um, the one per thousand square feet is fine for studios and one bedrooms, but if it's above a one bedroom, so a two bedroom and up, it reverts or it goes to 0.7 spaces per bedroom and th so then if that was if that was thrown into calculation let's say there's a, a project with 31 bedrooms and 10 two bedrooms right the two bedroom calculation would be done based on on that number and then the square footage of those two two bedroom units would be taken out and then it's just the square footage of the one bedrooms and studios would be calculated on that and then just blend it all together at the end with the total. So on a two bedroom, that would be 1.4 spaces per two bedroom and 2.1 for a three. I concur that I do believe that a developer is gonna provide as many as they feel are necessary, probably over provide. So my guess is that on the residential component of mixed use developments that they're gonna overshoot this anyway. Perhaps uh, I could make a uh, recommendation here from what I'm hearing from your discussions, you're all in support of staff recommendation generally, but there's some thought that maybe some additional need consideration needs to be paid to whether or not we should change the standard for two bedrooms and above. Maybe a motion could be to move staff recommendation with the additional recommendation that the city council um, uh, analyze the issue regarding the two bedroom parking further. We can have Nelson Nygaard provide us with some additional information at the council level and staff as well and maybe that would be the best way to move things forward up to the city council. Although you're free to do anything else. <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, I'm trying to do some math here that if we, and where I get confused where you break from the square footage calculation to the bedroom count, and that gets pretty confusing for me really quickly, so I tried to do it a different way and said, okay, if we're a, if we're a, a one bedroom or a studio and under, it's, it's one parking space. That's already as per our requirement in the new standard, is that correct? Well, t and technically and it'd be one per thousand square feet. Correct, I understand that, but, or, or one, at minimum one space. Right. 
Right, and I wanted to clarify that, that you're not, you're not trying to eliminate the one space per unit minimum also. I don't believe that's the case. No, I think. I okay, that's good. Um, I think that you're keeping that in. So if you have, if you have apartments that are smaller, you're still going to have one per apartment as a minimum that may require more parking spaces than one per thousand, correct? Correct. Okay, good, thank you. Would you, um, did you want to make a motion on this and we could start trying to piece it together? I'm, I'm Because that's where I'm struggling to get uh, it moving. We need to have something to kind of tweak. I, I'm happy order. to make a motion. I guess I wanted to know if there was any other comment or discussion on my other two recommendations, one about the more thorough study of the in lieu fee and about the 80% trigger based on publicly available spaces. Do, do, do you have an, and then I'll be happy to make sure. a motion. So it, it sounds like we already have provisions for more detailed analysis. I, if you could, I guess I want to put some teeth in it because it, because it, if I'm not, if I'm hearing you correctly, you every year you, you go back and, and take a look at it. is it, is it fair? Is it equitable? Is it enough? Is it too much? Is that already part of this this plan? Yes, it is. Okay, so if I just need to know what kind of language you want in that because it sounds like we already have that baked in here, in in a sense. And I don't want to again get too down in the details. I believe you know, generally speaking, the city staff and the, I mean, this, this is what they do on a daily basis. And if there's provisions in there, we leave them. In, you know, we leave them in there if they need to be beefed up. Um, that we should beef them up. A, a yearly review seems reasonable to me. And then as it relates to the 80%, I, I don't have any issue with that. I think a close monitoring of the, the downtown parking area is, is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. I also know that these projects will come back before us every single time there's a, pr a new project down there since it's in the coastal plan. So that'll be another moment for us to take a look, take a snapshot. How are things working now? And so then at that point, I would assume we can give direction to staff as well to, to start looking at certain things if we if there are hot spots or areas where parking is starting to get challenged. Um, but I'm not opposed to, to that the idea of adding that language that they're, you're really looking at two things. You're looking at the public supply and then the overall supply of parking. And the, the trigger is 80% when we're, we do a deeper dive and come back with more information. Okay, so uh, with that being said, I'd like to make a motion. I move that we uh, recommend to council that we support um, the findings of staff and the recommendation, recommendation of staff uh, with the exception of, I recommend that we add in there that there be a restudy trigger at 80% based on when 80% of the available to the public spaces are occupied. So that would include on-street parking and any shared parking that's available. And additionally, I recommend that we keep the one space per residential unit minimum for studios and one bedrooms. And we also keep the one space per thousand square foot ratio for those studios and one bedrooms, but that for two bedrooms and larger, we recommend 0.7 spaces per bedroom. Okay, is that, the mo is that your motion? Yes. Okay. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay, that's a second. So um, I think this is the point where we can have further discussion. To ask for maybe some tweaks. You can have further discussion or propose a different motion or vote on the motion. Great. So um, I'd like to propose a, a small change to that motion if possible. And that would be that we recommend that the city study that specific bedroom count issue with more data instead of imposing a number on them. I'd like them to actually bring more information to the council so that when they make the final decision, they have the concern really vetted out instead of us just putting a number down. 
So if, if you make that minor tweak, I, I, uh, I could get behind this 100%. I, I'm, I'm completely happy to support that so long as it doesn't impose a big slowdown in taking it to council. We, sh we should be able to make our, our target date to council still. Thank you. Okay, great. And you're okay with that? I guess I do. I need to uh, amend the motion. I guess. Yeah, it seems clear that the original movement is okay with the amendment. So we just need to make sure that you're still willing to second that motion. I second it. Then we call for the question. Mr. Boats. My screen is still there. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay, the motion passes. Thanks for everyone for coming out tonight and speaking. We really appreciate your time. And uh, that moves us on to old business, I believe. I need everyone to um, either exit quickly. We still have part of the meeting to conduct. We're not done yet. Excuse me, everyone. We are still conducting a meeting. If you could yes. please wait until the end. No, thank you. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Old business. Oh, I'll let the record reflect that. Mr. or what am I? I'm chairwoman now. Um, is back in uh, conducting the uh, meeting. Old business, there is no old business. New business, there is no new business. And staff reports. I would just like to remind the commission that the next uh, regularly scheduled meeting of the planning commission is on Memorial Day, so that meeting is canceled. So May 25th, I believe, is the date. Yes. Um, so that is is a, a canceled meeting. And um, I just wanted to make sure you were all aware of that. Okay. Um, we move on to commissioner comments. Um, does anyone want to report on something that they've seen in, uh, you know, attended in Dana Point or? I'm, I'm, I, oh, I'm sorry, may I? Yes. <laughs> I'm just excited to be here. Thank you for sticking around. Uh, <laughs> But, but more excited to work closely with my fellow commissioners. This was certainly, we got tossed hot potato tonight and I think everybody did a great job walking through what could have been a really tough decision. So I'm just yeah. appreciative to be here and, and the support of staff to get us to where we got to. Thank you. All right. This, for me, this Murphy. is a huge learning curve talking about this stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I think I understood it all <laughs> and um, on to other subjects. Commissioner, <laughs> Commissioner McCann. Uh, I'd like to echo the thoughts of my uh, two fellow commissioners that were here. And additionally, just uh, make note for the record that I will not be able to attend the, that first meeting in June. Thank you. And, and if I can just add, I should have done it, I guess, under staff comments. But um, I'm very impressed. This was difficult subject matter that we have all had a long time to digest and go through, and um, you all did come up to speed very quickly. It was very impressive, and so I'm really looking forward to working with all of you, plus our veteran planning commissioners uh, as we move forward. Um, yeah, I just wanted to welcome our new commissioners, and yeah, it, it was a tough night. I was watching it on the TV screen out there, and I thought, wow, they're doing an awesome job. So, um, I, you know, welcome and congratulations, and I'm really uh, want to say thank you for the support uh, for uh, electing me as chairwoman. I really appreciate that, and hopefully, I won't make too many mistakes and get everybody. <laughs> through this. So um, with that, we'll move on to adjournment and the next regular meeting of the Planning Commission will be held on Monday, June 8th, 2015, beginning at 6 p.m. or as soon thereafter in the City Council Chamber 
located at 33282 Golden Lantern Suite 210 in beautiful Dana Point, California. Good